Is the fatigue that you're feeling over training or just the normal fatigue we all should expect when training hard? It's a question that will drive runners crazy. So in today's video, I'm going to delve deep and give you some of the actual measurable data you can use to tell the difference between being overtrained and normal fatigue. You're going to learn the difference between normal training fatigue and overtraining, why training fatigue is sometimes okay and even needed, some measurable ways to tell if you're overtraining, and how to dig yourself out of being overtrained. So if you've ever felt paralyzed by the decision of whether you should be feeling tired or if it's something more serious, then this video is for you. In all honesty, understanding the difference between normal training fatigue and overtraining is definitely one of the most difficult things I had to do as both an athlete and as a coach. Trust me, I've had countless mental battles about whether I was truly tired and overtrained or whether I just needed to suck it up and push it through. I can recall when I was still running professionally, times when I'd be sitting on the couch after a nap, really not wanting to go out for a run because I was still half asleep and just so tired and wondering if it was being weak or if I really needed to back off. Even now, when I'm just training for fun and using to experiment myself, I have long debates in my head about whether I should be working out because I'm feeling tired and I don't know if it's just the normal tiredness I'm supposed to feel or if I'm on the verge of overtraining. So with that said, let's start out with the difference between overtraining and just being tired. Both will feel the same, but overtraining has some specific measurable effects on the body that we can identify and use to determine if we are in fact overtrained or not. I'm going to discuss these more in depth in a moment. So when an athlete asks me the difference, the first step I ask them to do is to start gathering the measurable data. I'll say this again later, but most of this data I'm talking about should be stuff you're collecting routinely if you're training hard or training for a race, at least gathering somewhat frequently. If none of the data matches up, then you can probably assume that you're not overtrained. Now, this isn't 100% foolproof, so you still want to keep an eye out and keep tabs on the data, but the chances are good you're just tired if none of the measurable data matches up. So you've concluded that you're just tired. What should you do? Should you run through it, take days off? Well, the answer depends on a few things. In my opinion, you definitely should consider a day or two off or taking something like a down week if any of the following are true. One, you're just coming off an injury or a severely injury prone or dealing with something. In this case, the added fatigue may aggravate or cause an injury. That's not something that we want. Second, your gait is impacted. This could be because of an injury or just being overly tired. I know my gait tends to get really sloppy if I'm super tired or sore. I tend to shuffle, which puts a lot of stress on my lower legs. If you feel like running tired is going to impact your normal running form, take a rest day or two. Third, I'll finish this off by saying it's always better to be cautious rather than aggressive. We as runners overestimate just how important one or two runs in a training cycle are. If you envision every mile or kilometer you do over a 16 or 20 week training plan as a drop in a bucket, imagine how little difference missing a few drops at the end of your training cycle matters. In my opinion, it's very, very little. So always err on the side of caution rather than being aggressive. Okay, so you've decided that you hit none of the prerequisites for needing a day off. These are the times when you just need to physically or mentally push through the fatigue. Now, how can this be a good thing? Well, the basis for all training theory is what we call the workout and recovery process. Running first breaks down your muscle fibers. The harder you run, the more muscle fibers you damage. Your body then works to rebuild these damaged muscle fibers and the recovery process goes well. These muscle fibers are repaired stronger than before. That's how you become a faster and stronger runner through training. But as you may realize, it's nearly impossible to fully recover from a workout in 24 hours. It might be possible following a very easy day of running, but any type of speed, tempo, or long run is going to require anything from 2 to 14 days to fully absorb and recover. That means unless you're only running one or two days a week, training while fatigued is a necessary part of training, especially since we know that slow, easy mileage is the best way to build an aerobic endurance and is the foundation for running performance. The trick is finding that balance between running enough miles to build your aerobic capacity without overdoing the fatigue. Fatigue, and herein lies the art of training. However, there's also a way that we can utilize this fatigue to make training more effective. In training vernacular, coaches use a term called accumulated fatigue to describe this. Basically, this theory posits that the fatigue from one workout accumulates and transfers to the next run. So you're always starting a workout or a long run a little tired from your previous training. This is important for longer distance races like the marathon because it's nearly impossible to run the full distance in training. Furthermore, if you were to start every workout fully recovered and fresh, it would be difficult to simulate how your body feels late into the race. As such, we can strategically implement the theory of accumulated fatigue to better target the specific demands of your race. For example, during marathon training, one of my favorite methods of introducing accumulated fatigue is to buttress the long run against a shorter but steady paced run the day before. As an illustration, you would run six miles at marathon pace on the Saturday before your Sunday long run. Because of the harder running on Saturday, you start Sunday's long run at zero miles, but rather at six or seven miles, since this is the level of fatigue and glycan depletion your body is carrying over from the previous run. So how do you find the right balance? 
Obviously, training would be much easier and runners much happy if you could just train hard and fatigued all the time. But you simply can't continue to accumulate fatigue and run these types of workouts all the time. There needs to be a balance. First, try to keep the specific accumulated fatigue workouts to once every two weeks and only schedule them during the race-specific portion of your training schedule. This ensures that you don't overdo it and that you don't get burnt out long-term. Be sure to keep your easy runs slow. One of the most common mistakes runners make is running their easy days too fast. This hinders your ability to recover and doesn't provide any additional aerobic benefit. Research has shown that the most optimal aerobic pace for an easy run is about 65% of 5K pace. For a 20 minute 5K runner, this would mean about 840 per mile on your easy days. Now, let's talk about how we can measure overtraining symptoms. I'm gonna discuss these in order in terms of how easy they are to track and how often I track them in my training. First up is sleep quality. Perhaps one of the easiest ways to self-monitor for overtraining is to constantly monitor your sleep quality. According to a review of overtraining research from 2018, sleep disturbances are a common symptom experienced by athletes who are overtrained. The exact reasons why overtraining can lead to sleep disturbances aren't fully yet understood, but it's thought that the physiological and psychological stresses of intense training may disrupt normal sleep patterns. These disturbances can take a number of different forms, including difficulty falling asleep, which can lead to feelings of frustration, anxiety, and restlessness. Even if overtrained athletes are able to fall asleep initially, you may wake up frequently during the night, which can disrupt the normal sleep cycle and leave you feeling tired or groggy the next day. You also may experience reduced sleep quality. Overtraining can lead to a decrease in overall sleep quality, meaning you're not feeling as rested or refreshed after sleeping as you normally would. And finally, overtrained athletes may experience a decrease in their total sleep time, either through a difficulty of falling asleep, like we talked about before, or waking up frequently during the night. Others may find that they are sleeping more than usual, but still not feeling rested. Luckily, sleep tracking is really easy to do, and I recommend you set it up before you're even experiencing any tiredness or overtraining symptoms. This way, you have a baseline for what your normal or good is, and then you can monitor when the data starts to head south. Another common sign of overtraining is changes in appetite. Studies have shown that some overtrained athletes may experience a decrease in appetite, which can lead to unintended weight loss or nutritional deficiencies they are not able to maintain a balanced diet. You may also experience an increase in cravings for specific foods, particularly those that are high in carbohydrates or sugar. This can be a sign that the body is trying to compensate for the energy deficiencies caused by intense training. The exact reasons why overtraining can lead to changes in appetite are not yet fully understood, but it's thought that the physiological and psychological stresses of intense training may disrupt normal hunger signals and lead to changes in food preferences or intake. Another fairly easy indication of overtraining is monitoring your illness or how often you're getting sick. The research is pretty conclusive that overtraining increases your risk of illness. The specific type of illnesses that overtrained athletes may be more susceptible to can vary. A suppressed immune system, because your immune system isn't as efficient at clearing up the normal viruses you normally be able to and avoid getting sick. Or elevated stress hormones, which we'll talk about in a second. The physiological stress of overtraining can sometimes lead to an increase in stress hormones such as cortisol, which can suppress the immune function and increase your risk of illness. So if you notice yourself getting sick more frequently, or it's taking you longer to recover from things like a basic cold, this could be a sign that you're overtraining and that what you feeling is a little more than just normal fatigue. Hormonal changes are perhaps one of the most surefire ways to determine if you're suffering from overtraining or not. Unfortunately, it's also the most difficult or expensive to monitor. Likely, you'll need some help from your healthcare provider. But if you do want to test your hormone levels, here's what I suggest you look at. First, cortisol. Overtraining can lead to an increase in the stress hormone cortisol, which can have a number of negative effects on the body, including the suppression of the immune system, impairing sleep quality, and increasing your risk of illness, all the things we talked about before. Testosterone. Overtraining can also lead to a decrease in testosterone levels, particularly in male athletes. This can lead to a decrease in muscle mass, reduce energy levels, and a decrease in overall athletic performance. Overtraining can also lead to a decrease in growth hormone levels, which can impair muscle recovery and lead to a decrease in muscle mass. Finally, overtraining can also affect insulin sensitivity, which can impact how the body metabolizes and uses glucose. This can lead to a decrease in energy levels and increases in feelings of fatigue. Now, finally, I'll mention that for female runners, there may be some hormonal changes that impact your menstrual cycle. So this is another data point that you may want to pay attention to. Specifically, overtraining can lead to a decrease in estrogen levels, which can disrupt the normal menstrual cycle. This can, disruption can lead to changes in your menstrual cycle length, such as a shorter cycle or a longer cycle, as well as changes in frequency, such as irregular periods or missed periods. So if you do experience any changes in your menstrual cycle, I recommend that you consult your doctor as this could lead to serious issues. So now that you know you may be overtrained, if any of these markers match up for you, how do you dig yourself out and how do you manage 
get back on track. Now, honestly, researchers and coaches are varied on the exact amount of time you'll need to fully recover from a bout of overtraining. Primarily, the rest period that you're going to need is going to depend on how severe your symptoms are and how quickly your body responds. Personally, I suggest taking at least two to three weeks before you even think about running again if you do find that yourself overtrained, if you have any of the biomarkers we mentioned above. More than likely, you're going to need six to eight weeks of complete rest before you're fully recovered. During this time, focus as much as you can on the recovery protocols. These things would include dynamic stretching, self-massage, warm and cold baths, and probably the most important element, sleep. I also think focusing on nutrition can play a huge role in getting you back faster. The first thing a runner has to look at when they're overtrained is the amount of calories they're taking in on a daily basis. The reality is that most runners do not eat enough calories to fuel their calorie expenditure. This lack of calories means the muscles aren't getting the nutrients and fuel they need to recover. So if you are overtrained or think you may be overtrained, look to consume about 300 to 500 calories more per day than you normally burn. It's also important that you increase your calorie intake at the right times and with the right foods. Simply eating an extra helping of dinner or a handful of junk food at work isn't going to help you recover. Instead, focus on adding nutrient-dense and protein-rich foods. Protein is the main muscle-building nutrient required to repair the small micro tears runners inflict on their muscles with every hard workout that you run. Therefore, it's critical that if you are in danger of overtraining, consume ample amounts of lean protein. This extra protein consumption will provide the essential nutrients and amino acids needed for muscle repair. If you're a vegetarian, you'll need to combine protein sources to ensure that you're getting the full range of amino acids. For example, you can combine grains with legumes or dairy, vegetables with soy or dairy, or legumes with nuts. Whatever your favorite combination is, make sure that you're getting enough extra protein if you believe you're overtrained. The second important power food you're going to want to eat is your fruits and vegetables. Most fruits and vegetables are superfoods for runners who need to focus on recovery because they are nutrient dense and contain high qualities of essential vitamins and minerals necessary for muscle repair. To help you out, here's a simple diet for the average runner fighting from overtraining. Now, these don't include serving sizes because each person's caloric needs are going to be different. So usually for breakfast, we have two breakfasts. The breakfast one would be overnight oatmeal with vanilla protein powder, berries, Greek yogurt, almond milk, chia seeds, and wheat germ. Second breakfast, we do half egg whites, half egg regular eggs with cheese, spinach, peppers, and onions. For lunch, we could do a grilled chicken sandwich and a small spinach salad with peppers, broccoli, carrots. Use a small amount of olive oil or mandarin oranges for dressing as needed. Now, a midday snack could be something like oranges or a handful of nuts. Brazilian, walnut, pistachios are all good options. And then dinner would be something like salmon with brown rice and asparagus. And you can definitely include a nighttime snack. I love cottage cheese with fruit like strawberries. Obviously, feel free to mix and match any of the favorite foods and vegetables with this generalized diet device and make sure to consume an extra 300 to 500 calories per day and ready to get back to training hard in a few weeks. In conclusion, take a few weeks to fully rest, focus on recovery and your diet, and you'll be back before you know it. I hope this episode helped you better understand the differences between fatigue and overtraining and how to overcome and use both. Thanks for listening today, guys, and we'll talk to you soon. Have a great run today.